Um, I'm Sharon and a member here at Pinna Baptist Church and it is a joy to be sharing God's word with you this morning. So today we are starting a new four-part series on the book of James and we begin with the testing of your faith in James chapter 1. Before we start, let us pray. Father God, it is a privilege to gather together to explore your word. As we delve into this passage, I pray that you would open our hearts and minds to hear what you have to say to us. We come ready and expectant to hear your word. Amen. Now, before we dive into this scripture, I just want to provide some context around James. Now, the most common view of the early Christians is that James was written by Jesus' brother, also known as James the Just. James was a prominent figure in the early Jerusalem church, references in passages and acts. That said, the fact that James, the brother of Jesus, may have written this letter is largely irrelevant, in that the writer makes no mention of any brotherly relationship with Jesus. Rather, in verse 1, he writes this letter, referencing his spiritual relationship as the servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. He uses Jesus' exalted status, and it is from this perspective that we read this letter. Now, James was martyred in around AD 62, and we can consider that Paul and James were preaching in parallel, Paul starting in the synagogues of each visited town and then preaching to the Gentiles. James, on the other hand, had a different focus. We read in James chapter 1, he writes to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. When Stephen was killed and persecution broke out, Jewish Christians traveled to Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, and further to Assyria, Babylon, and Egypt, and those places that war had driven them. The now scattered Jewish Christians were in a place of suffering, experiencing oppression, poverty, and persecution. James is looking to encourage people throughout the challenges they face. Now, James is a short book. It has a moral tone and practical content, known for its wisdom and conciseness. There are crossing themes throughout, and James uses many metaphors and illustrations in this letter to aid his readers in instruction and understanding of the message, as he exhorts and encourages them in their journey with faith. And so we begin the first of our four sessions in chapter 1, And James wastes no time and launches into trials and temptations in James chapter 1, verses 2 to 18. Feel free to use our church Bibles to read along, or the words will come up behind me. James chapter 1, verses 2 to 18, and I'll be reading from the NIV version. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind." That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with the scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life. And the Lord has promised, the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. 
He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruit of all that he created. Now, I don't know about you, but James' opening line is a bit of a conundrum. Count it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. Now, it's not often that we see a relationship between trials and joy. We might feel joy when they're ended and they're over, but not really while we're going through them. We often use happiness and joy interchangeably in our language, but these words are quite different. While happiness can be momentary and temporal, joy is something we live in. I like Compassion UK's definition of joy. Joy, a fruit of the spirit, comforting, content and full of peace. An enduring attitude of the heart and spirit and a natural part of the Christian faith. It's often connected with, but not limited to, following Jesus and pursuing a Christian life. John Piper describes Christian joy as, Christian joy is a good feeling in the soul, produced by the Holy Spirit as he causes us to see the beauty of Christ in the word and in the world. Joy is an emotion. It happens in the soul. And we may experience physical effects of this. It may give us butterflies in our tummy, an outburst of laughter, or even tears. We don't create it. These movements of the soul are produced by the Holy Spirit. Hence, it is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit opens the eyes of our hearts, we see the beauty of Christ. When we see Christ in all that he is doing, all that he is, then our hearts are drawn out in joy towards him. We see Christ in the word, the Bible as we read it, as well as all the good gifts he gives to us. We find it in nature, we see it in others, and all God's works. Now when I visited a church in Guyana, South America, the people there had very little. Some would be unsure how to feed their families in the coming weeks. Others questioning how long they might have a roof over their head. But in the house of the Lord, permeating the room, Despite their trials, it was evident in their worship and their fire for God that there was a deep and profound sense of joy. I felt it. It was very present. But logically, I could not explain it. If these followers of Christ could experience joy in this way, so should all Christians. As we explore today's passage, we will unpack how during trial and testing we can adjust our approach and perspective as we come to read his word. As the Holy Spirit opens our eyes to truly experience this enduring joy of the soul as we seek to perfect and mature our Christian character. Now, whilst this is a dense scripture, you'll be pleased to know I'm only focusing on four key points. Have the first slide, please, Margaret. Firstly, We are to persevere in trials. Secondly, we are to ask God for wisdom. Thirdly, in the asking, ask in faith without doubt. And lastly, we are to resist the temptations when they come. So let's start with defining trials and temptations. Next slide, please. So trials are defined by the Cambridge Dictionary as a test usually over a limited period of time to discover how effective or suitable something or someone is. Now, we're probably quite familiar with the obvious trials, financial, suffering loss of loved ones, physical and mental health. Some of us are affected by the cost of living crisis or know others that are. We also hear of war and persecution across the globe and these extreme trials experienced by many. But many of us don't recognize the test and trials in the everyday so readily. And as we read today, we should consider all trials. Some may affect us harder than others, but nonetheless, they can all be considered as we explore today's passage. Temptations are defined as a feeling that you want to do or have something, although you know you should not. Notice that this definition is based on our desire, not something that others put on us. 
Temptations are around us all the time. We're bored and bored at work, and we pick up our phone and scroll social media. Or we have a need to escape the world and turn to drugs or alcohol. Now, I'm not saying that all temptations are detrimental, but we are presented with them all the time. And ultimately, the choice is purely ours as to whether we act on these temptations. As we consider what trials and temptations are, let's look at what James has to say in this passage. As we saw from our definition, trials are effectively tests, and this scripture identifies God's purposes of these tests and trials. So firstly, persevere in trials. In verse 3 to 4, we read, Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Testing of our faith produces perseverance. And in other translations, steadfastness, patience, enduring, unwavering faith. So why perseverance? Can I have the next slide, please? When someone works out or does resistance training like barbells, What is the purpose? Purpose is to build size, strength, and endurance. We too are building strength in this trial, readying ourselves for the next trial, expanding the breadth and depth of our faith, and learning to persevere, endure, to stand for longer, trusting God, his provision, and his faithfulness. And how does the resistance trainer work out? Do they train in their comfortable space? Or do they push harder in their workouts? They would press on, add a few more reps, add some heavier weights to ensure they make steady progress. We too must push our comfortable boundaries in perseverance levels. And as our faith is tested more, press on and work harder to persevere remaining faithful to God long-term and through difficulty. Romans chapter 5, verses 3 to 5 says, But we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. Trials perfect our faith. We build Christian character and increase our spiritual maturity. We become stronger in our faith and perfecting and being complete in Christ. It's a continual process. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7 says, You have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes through it, is tested by fire may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The process of perseverance is refining us. We sing about refiner's fire, melting down the silver and gold which separates the impurities that would decrease its value. As we persevere and look to God, he will separate our impurities in our Christian character, maturing us, completing us, all through his Holy Spirit working in us as Jesus Christ is revealed and we can experience a deep joy, praising and glorifying and honouring our God. The journey to perfecting Christian character is God's goal in our trials. It is far easier to stand firm when all is well. So what happens when everything falls apart? When we think God seems silent? Our second point, we are to ask God for wisdom. James chapter 1 verse 5 continues, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Romans 12.12 says, Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. In this passage, we are called to be patient in affliction and faithful in prayer. Does James suggest in these verses that we ask God for an end to this trial? 
Interestingly, no. Rather, we are to ask God for wisdom through prayer. Ask God for his guidance. How should we judge things through God's eyes? How do we manage our spirit, our Christian character, in the trial that we are facing? When we are at our weakest, when we don't know which way to turn, we can ask God for wisdom, knowing that our God gives generously. The passage says he gives generously to all, not just a select few, to all, and he gives liberally without finding fault. I sometimes hear people say, I'm not good at prayer. I don't speak eloquently like others. But our God gives generously, without finding fault. Pray for wisdom in faith from your heart. Thirdly, as we ask for wisdom, ask in faith without doubt. James chapter 1 verses 6 to 8 says, But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. We are called to be faithful in prayer, and we must believe. We are to ask wholeheartedly, without reservation, sincere in intention and expectation. Can I have the next slide, please? James uses the imagery of the waves blown and tossed by the wind, which have no grounding, being carried to and fro, lifted up in faith, and then tossed as our hearts are lacking in trust. When the doubt creeps in, we lose the ability to stand firm. We are more likely to be tempted, and we put ourselves in a really vulnerable position. We create instability and may not know where we will end up. Putting our complete trust in God should keep us even and steady along the way. We must have a strong understanding of God's truths in his word and hold on to these in times of trial. A key moment in the testing of my faith and trials was my journey with having children. Obviously, this is my side of the story and not Alan's. After being diagnosed with a chronic condition which could leave me childless, I was faced with the fact that the choice to have children may be taken out of my hands. Following an operation, the doctors told me that I had to make a decision about children very soon. Now, because I didn't plan to have children, this time of consideration took about four years. We decided to try for kids, and praise God, I fell pregnant with Cameron pretty much straight away. It's not much of a trial, I hear you say. But my problems came conceiving a second child. I lost a baby, which took me down a somewhat dark path of blame. And what followed was years of being focused on conceiving a second child, tracking temperatures, cycles, alternative therapies, and numerous specialists. I reached some real lows as my physical and mental health fluctuated as I went through various procedures and medications. I felt like a complete failure for not being able to give Cameron the gift that Alan and I had of siblings. Although, to be fair, I'm not sure Cameron or Ethan see siblings as a gift from time to time. I continue to pray and seek God as to his plans and what this season in my life was. But I got no answers. It felt like silence. And I was just wandering aimlessly with no clear direction. And I hit a point where I had to take back control of this situation. Choose self-reliance. So I set myself a cut-off date. If I wasn't pregnant by then, that was it. I was done with this second child. Now, after we had Cameron, we were considering a house move. And in that process, Cameron and I checked out a few churches around London. And it happened that on that second cut-off date, We were visiting a church in Harrow. I was so done with this journey. But during the service, a lady shared an ultrasound after her long-awaited pregnancy and said if someone was thinking about giving up on a baby today, then they shouldn't. I was struck. In that moment, I had to let go of my limited control in this trial. 
I had already succumbed to the temptation of taking my situation out of God's hands and putting it in my own. And I had to relinquish it. This was now in God's hands as my provider. I learned a fierce lesson about temptation in my attempt to control the narrative, that human desire. I was essentially questioning God's provision, and it became my plan, not his plan. And if I'd gone ahead with my cutoff date, we could have missed the opportunity for a second child. Now, what followed was not an immediate change of circumstances. I underwent the operation I said I would never do and continued on a medicated regime which, praise God, ultimately for us, resulted in a positive outcome. I learned a lesson in this trial, a step closer to where God needed me to be, teaching me to be patient in the trial, persevere and be reliant on God's provision, trusting that he was in control and relinquishing my own temptation to control. With my need to control certain situations laid bare, this trial and temptation is a constant reminder for me to question my own desires and to continue to look to God for wisdom. In fact, this trial was so much more than I expected. As a result, I was in a privileged position to be able to share and support others struggling with similar situations, to share my long-term story of struggles, to hold them up in prayer and journey alongside them in the day-to-day. Not only does it hopefully bless them, but I feel blessed in the process. So on to our final point, resisting temptation. As we have defined already, temptation is based on our desires and our choices. To illustrate this temptation, I would like to share one of my own crisps. Now, for me, as long as, gluten, as long as crisps are gluten-free, I'm not too fussy about flavor. Ready salted, mm, no. But in our house, I refuse to buy crisps. So when I go to the shops, unless the kids want them, I don't buy them. I don't have them in the house, so I can't be tempted. But I don't live on my own. And Alan, with his generous nature, knows I like them, so he buys them for me as a treat. So when I go to the cupboard and look, I could say, Alan is tempting me, it's his fault. But actually, the responsibility to act on my temptation is all mine. I am tempted by the crisps in the cupboard, and it's me that chooses to pick them up and eat them. Equally, if Alan puts some crisps in front of me, I have the choice to take them or to eat them. Or not. By the same principle, God does not tempt us. It's our desires and our choice. James chapter 1, verses 13 to 15 says, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. On to the real consequences of giving in to temptation. That James tells us that it's not the end of the story, simply being dragged away by our own desires and temptations. Dale C. Allison Jr. writes a five-stage process in temptation. First, temptation. Secondly, sin conceived. Thirdly, sin given birth to then sin maturing, and finally, death, spiritual death. James is very clear on the cycle of sin. The temptation in itself is not sinful, but when we choose to say yes to temptation, sin is conceived and the sinful path is taken. It births in us, matures until death. Matthew Henry writes, There is death upon the soul, and death comes upon the body, and besides death, spiritual and temporal, the wages of sin is eternal death too. Giving in to our own desires and temptations is a slippery slope of sin, which compounds to some hefty consequences as we allow it to grow and mature. Sometimes we don't stop to think of the real consequences of acting on temptations when they come. But we should use these truths to help us to resist temptation. 
Whilst we've established that God does not tempt us, James, in verses 17, goes on to tell us what God does give us. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. We serve the Father of lights, and from as early as creation, we see that every good and perfect gift comes from him. We know this as we see it in all that he is. He is love, all that is good, holy, righteous, pure. I could go on and on. Now, I've got a visual example here. Alan, can I get some help, please? A measuring retractable tape. Okay, so uh, this tape represents our relationship with God. And Alan represents God. Do not read anything into that. Now, in my testimony, when I started my trial, I felt like I was moving towards God in the way that I was, I was persevering, I was seeking, seeking wisdom, I was looking to God, I knew that I was being, you know, God is faithful. But then the doubt came in. And then I started to be tempted. I wanted to control it, to choose self-reliance. And suddenly, I'm moving further away from him with my doubt and my need to control. Temptations can be really subtle. Apathy, indifference, I'm going to do nothing. Or passion, I feel so passionate about this, it must be of God, when actually it's our own desires. Now, why do we give up in trials? Because trials are really tough. Enduring is tough. God wants us to endure in the trial. He wants us to ask him for wisdom, to build this Christian character so we can see joy as he is revealed. But all too often... We're tempted. We say yes to the temptation. We doubt. And then it becomes easier to doubt and be tempted again and again. And before we know it, we're so far from him. We serve a God of grace. We sung about it in the first song. By the grace of God, we carry on. We can ask God for forgiveness. He forgives. He's a loving God. And we, read, we sung in that song as well, forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. Forever God is with us. We can go back on our path to faithfulness, choosing God, asking forgiveness, building spiritual maturity, moving closer to him in the trial. And as we go to the next trial, We've learned from the previous one, moving closer to him. Now, I can't do this illustration without referencing verse 17. God does not change like shifting shadows. In fact, we are changing like shifting shadows, not God. Why is God? He's constant, unchanging, undivided. Thank you, Alan, my glamorous assistant. (laughs) As we consider our periods of trial and testing, how do we view their purpose in our lives? What are we expecting in this process? Based on his word, what do we need to see and do differently? To close, I go back to the first verse of today's passage. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. Verse 12 says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. What is the crown of life? Revelation chapter 2 verse 10 
gives us some clarity. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will come, will will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. We should adopt an eternal perspective. Our crown is beyond the trials and suffering in this earthly life. But through persevering and remaining faithful to God, this is our ultimate eternal blessing, the crown of life. Can I have the final slide, please? Final one, next one. I missed that one. (laughs) Thank you. We will see a blessing, the crown of life, not in the trial or test itself, but as we turn towards him, as we persevere and endure, as we pray and ask God for wisdom and believe sincerely and wholeheartedly in faith, without doubt, and resist our fleshly desires and temptations. In doing this, we will see Christ in all that he is doing and all that he is. As we do this, we will grow in spiritual maturity, completeness, lacking in nothing. This will fill our hearts with joy in the depths of our very being. And through the Holy Spirit, we will see the beauty of Christ. Let us pray. Father God, we long to draw nearer to you to grow in our faith and gain a deeper understanding of who you are. As trials hit us and we seek to endure and persevere, we pray that you would grant us wisdom when we ask. And where, where doubt and temptation seek to pull us further from you, we pray that we would recognize those times and take active steps to lean into you. Persevere, pray and ask you for wisdom without doubt and resisting temptation in those trying times. As you walk alongside us and carry us in the days, weeks and months ahead, let us not lose sight of your sovereignty, faithfulness, love, mercy and grace. Amen.